Hello again, members. I'm Catherine McMackin, membership manager here at the Henry Ford. We're getting ready for another big opening this weekend, this time for our newest permanent exhibit, Driven to Win, Racing in America, presented by General Motors. And I'm revved up that we have two special guests to help us preview this experience in today's THF conversation for members, Driven to Win Sneak Peek. First, I'm delighted to welcome back our Curator of Transportation, Matt Anderson. From cars to trains to airplanes, Matt has always been fascinated by things that move. He's constantly uncovering new stories from within the Henry Ford's transportation collections. And after many years of planning, collecting, and anticipating, Matt is eager to share Driven to Win with us. And second, our experience design project manager, Wing Fong. Wing loves a good story, and he's extremely excited to share the people, passions, innovations, and drama of auto racing with our members and our guests. Uh, he's actually told me that for him, there's a hidden world in every exhibit project, and bringing it to life can be a ton of fun. So today, Wing and Matt will be showing us the sports car performance section of the exhibit to share the story of the 2016 Ford GT from its initial inception all the way to its success at the iconic 24-hour race at Le Mans. So as we get started, I hope you'll take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat feature with your first name and where you're joining us from. Um, and you can set that to show to everyone versus just panelists. Um, and when you show to everyone, we can kind of uh, use this feature to see each other and our member community there in the chat. Uh, and while you enjoy the program, uh, please do submit any questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can at the end. And as always, to our members, thank you again for your ongoing support of the Henry Ford. We continue to be so grateful that you join us in our commitment to our mission, especially in this period as we're opening new exhibits and bringing back some of those favorite experiences we've all been missing. So now I'll hand it over to Matt and Wing to take us to Driven to Win. Thanks, Kat. Thanks for the introduction and thanks everyone for joining us. And Wing, thanks for being here as well. Good to be here. I am going to share my screen here and hopefully everybody should be seeing that there. So uh, what we want to do is uh, Wing and I are going to kind of um, take you through a part of our exhibit here, one of the zones, our Sports Car Performance Center, where as Kat mentioned, we really hone in on the story of the 2016 Ford GT. And you'll all be able to see the exhibit in person on Friday when we do our members preview, but you're gonna get a chance here to go sort of deeper in where you could see just from peeking from the outside. You're gonna see the exhibit as it's finished. In fact, a couple of the pictures in here I, I took just this morning. So this is as fresh as it can be. But as we go through, we're gonna share some of the early concept artwork for this space. Then we're going to share photos of how it actually was built. So you can see how we've had to change things along the way and how things have in other places stay very true to our original vision. But uh, any exhibit is a, a living organism, especially as you design it. So things come and go and change depending on space, story requirements and budget too, frankly. So uh, there've been uh, been some changes through here, but I think in the end, we've ended up with a great, uh, a great project just to kind of orient you where we are. And probably most of you realize this already, but the exhibit space will be in the museum. We're looking here at the museum. The bottom would be the entrance where you come in there through the, the clock tower and then past the cornerstone into the DC-3. The exhibit itself is up in the top uh, right corner here. Um, what used to be a collection of racing cars and our commercial vehicles. If you remember like the, the Charles Geralt Motorhome, the uh, Fruha Trailer and Coles Land Express tractor, uh, those we've moved, they're all still on the floor. They're just on the other side of the railroad equipment here, kind of on the uh, the far right corner of the museum here, but uh, still there. And we've uh, used this space about 24,000 square feet. And Wing, I think that works out to roughly a third of our total vehicle footprint in the museum, doesn't it? Yeah, it's quite a bit. And it's actually one of the more larger sort of single topic exhibits that we have in the museum. We jump into the, the next photo here. This is uh, this is the big reveal. This is our concept art and wing. I don't know how many times we've, we've seen this in the last uh, year, year and a half. You see the date on it there, April 16th of 2019. So it's the drawing itself is almost two years old. 
But uh, this is our guiding vision of what the introduction to the exhibit would look like. And if you can imagine standing in the museum, you're looking toward the, the back wall, which is behind these, uh, these walls here. But behind you from this view would be our uh, former drive-in movie theater space in, in Driven to Win. You'd be standing in the car court. If you can picture that, the locomotives would be to your, your right and the uh, timeline in Driving America would be to your left with Heroes of the Sky. So for the first time here, we, we've taken the walls down that have been up surrounding the exhibit for, uh, for a long time now. And you can actually see the real thing as built. So here we are. And, and I'm so excited by how close this is to our original vision. Apart from some changes in the sign, uh, we, we pretty much were able to uh, deliver on, on what we anticipated. And uh, without going into too much detail, you'll, you'll see a couple of vehicles right away. One is the 1901 sweepstakes with uh, Henry Ford at the wheel and Spider Huff is riding mechanic on the running board there. You'll also see a couple of uh, figures of drivers here. We have Ken Block on the uh, left and then Barney Oldfield on the right as they stand by their own cars, Ken Block's Fiesta and, and Barney Oldfield's 999 respectively. But uh, Wing, there are also some, uh, some motion uh, things going on in here too on the sign, right? And I think people will be excited. When you see this in person, you'll be very excited to see that that sign is dynamic and it's active. And this is obviously a photo, but... The, the two images on either side of the type driven to win are actually projected onto that screen. So it's constantly in motion. It's the uh, sort of the textures of racing, we call it. So, you know, roads going by and there's flames and there's fire and smoke and just to kind of help, uh, help us get into the mood as we move into racing. And that was one of our, our earliest uh, challenges that we identified and wanted to be able to meet. And that's capturing frankly, the spectacle of racing, right? The Indianapolis 500 famously calls itself the greatest spectacle in racing. And as impressive as our vehicles are, as wonderful as the artifacts are, they are static. You know, they don't move when they're in the museum gallery. So capturing that, that sense of motion and movement was an important thing for us. And the sign helps us go a long way toward doing that. And I'll just share here, if, if you'll permit me to read the first bit of text you'll see as you enter the exhibit, because this is really what sets up the, the grand vision, if you will, for the whole story we try to tell in there. And it, Driven to win, racing in America. American racing reflects the very character of the American people. Its diverse forms and settings appeal to our independent spirit. Its sights and sounds satisfy our love of spectacle, and its dangers affirm our identity as a nation of risk takers, forever pushing the limits. From hot rodders in Southern California to bootleggers in North Carolina, American racing is shaped by athletes, innovators, and entrepreneurs who are inspired by challenge and driven to win. So a lot of, lot of content, a lot of ideas in that statement, but they really do set up the rest of the story. What we're trying to do is explain what makes American racing different from racing in other parts of the world, what it is about um, the American people that draw them to racing, and uh, where it is geographically. The different forms of racing were sort of born and, and bred, if you will, in the United States. So uh, that's, that's our setup there. And with that said, here's just a quick uh, overview of the space itself. We're looking down from the top, of course, and the back wall here, looking out over the staff parking lot is here. The car court is on the other side, on the right side of the photo. Uh, on the bottom side here of your screen would be Heroes of the Sky. On the top side of the screen would be the railroad equipment. And as you enter, and, and this is the space we looked at in that previous photo, here's the sweepstakes, what we call the dawn of racing, where we look at the, the early years of racing in the U.S., uh, showmanship, where we talk about performance in racing, and that's where you'll see Ken Block and Barney Oldfield. And then we move through the forms of racing, land speed racing out at Bonneville, hill climb racing at Pikes Peak, IndyCar racing, where else? At Indianapolis. Uh, stock car racing, we focus on the Daytona 500. We have a pit crew interactive, which uh, we'll be opening for guests at some point here as we get a little safer here in the, the pandemic. Our motorsports training center, where we talk about athletes and drivers. Drivers are athletes. Every bit is a uh, as, as much so as a football player or a basketball player. Then drag racing down here in what we're calling our hot rod entrance, where we look at sort of racing culture outside the track, if that makes sense. So uh, hot rodding for sure, but also racing movies. Uh, in the center, we have our movie theater experience, and it really is more than a film. It's an experience full of sights, sounds, and sensations of its own. That's about 15 minutes long and follows five young people who are chasing their racing dreams around the country. And then ringing the theater on the outside is what we call our winner's circle, conveniently in the shape of a circle. And that's typically the name used at a racetrack for where they have the podium set up, where the first, second, and third place winners go to uh, celebrate with champagne and, and floral wreaths and whatever it might be. But that's where we feature our real game changer, record breaker cars. So like the 
like the uh, Lotus Ford from 1965 at the Indianapolis 500 or uh, one of the Carl Kikoffer Chrysler 300s that sort of redefined what NASCAR racing was. Uh, but the space we're going to focus on today is over here in the top left corner, our Sports Car Performance Center, where we talk about sports car racing, which, uh, well, perhaps not quite as big in the U.S. as NASCAR or drag racing, still has a really strong following. But um, we go in a little different direction here in that we talk about uh, a race that doesn't take place in the U.S., but a race that takes place in France, the 24 Hour of Le Mans. But uh, we look at that race from an American perspective and, of course, talking about an American team that goes to win at that race. Wing, I should have mentioned our simulators right here as well. We've got six uh, racing simulators and these are, are uh, I say intense and I don't mean intense in the way that they're, they're going to be a little too much physically to handle, though they are pretty exciting, they're full motion, but intense in, in the sense of competition you feel. I know I feel it, I get behind the wheel of those and I, I wanna win. And we've noticed that with a lot of folks we've had back there testing them, even folks who are generally pretty mild mannered and easy going, they kind of get caught up in it pretty quickly. I don't know about you Wing, if you feel the same way. That's exactly right. You get in there and you just, competition overtakes you and going fast. Yeah, it, it's really exciting. Of course, they've got the wraparound screens, as I say, the full motion. You do have to strap in because they, they bounce around a bit, but you feel every every corner, every bump in the track. And that, those are going to be, I think, a big hit. So we're eager to, uh, to get those open as well. But let's talk about sports car racing. And again, that's just one of the many forms of racing we talk about. But as you come in, every zone has a, a sort of a setup story panel here, which explains what sports car racing is or stock car, Indy car, whatever form you're looking at. So if you read that first paragraph, we talk about it having its origins in Europe and how it's largely different from my uh, Indy car or uh, NASCAR racing. Those tend to be oval track racing, right, where you're going around what essentially is a circle. Maybe it's a tri-oval at uh, Daytona. Maybe it's a larger oval shape at uh, at Indianapolis. But still, moving around, just turning left, more or less, right? But sports car racing is what they might call road racing. You're, you're moving in both directions now. You have chicanes or sharp corners in the track. You sometimes have changes in elevation, hills you have to climb or go down. So all of those make the racing a little more complex than it might be on a simple oval track. And uh, if you're going to talk about sports car racing in America, you have to talk about America's sports car. So our friends at General Motors, who are presenting sponsors for the exhibit, have loaned us the Corvette you see there. And that car won the 24-hour of Daytona race, a, a great American sports car endurance race back in 2001, so uh, 20 years ago now. But it, it makes a nice introduction to the subject. Here's another nice view of that that car. And uh, yeah, we, we really do have to give a shout out to General Motors. They were generous not only with uh, support for the exhibit, but with loaning us cars too. I, we had some come in just today, in fact. Yeah, they provided lots of great assistance. Um, you'll notice that the, we're not gonna talk about it today, but our picker activity, which Matt mentioned, you know, just take a look at those and General Motors provided those vehicles for us as well. And we're, we're looking here at a, a sample of what the labels will be like for each of those cars. And uh, if you've been in our, our Driving America exhibit, you'll you realize that, you know, it's not a terribly different format. You have your paragraph here with your main text, and then you have your specifications down below, everything from horsepower to, to top speed to, to transmission and so forth. Uh, photos along the side too. And I, in some cases, uh, there are a few more photos on these panels than there are in some of them in Driving in America. In other cases, a few less, but we present them in a different way. They tend to be a little larger here, take up more real estate on the panel, which I think is appropriate given the, uh, the oversized nature of racing. But what you don't see in this picture, but you will see in, in a few as we go along, in addition to the measurements here, we also have produced 3D printed models of every car in the racing exhibit. So guests who are visually impaired or who are just curious about what these cars feel like in terms of shape can actually touch and, and handle the cars. And, and Wing, I think we're really excited about those. And, and uh, almost this is a sort of a trial run to see if we might be able to do this sort of thing in other spaces in, in the museum. Yeah, 3D printing turned out to be a great uh, solution to this because we were able to actually 3D scan many of the vehicles in place in the museum. And then we worked with a modeler to create the models that we could print. And so now we have these files and we can continue to uh, print them and use them in different ways for various different programs moving forward too. Yeah, the, the 3D printing has come a long way, obviously, in terms of the printing technology, but also in terms of the scanning. You know, I think in my head, I'm still picturing these large frame structures with cameras everywhere, but it was pretty modest equipment that, that the fellow came in and did the scanning. I think he had a laptop and a few cameras he could move around. That was about it. 
It was actually a tab. It was a laptop and a tablet, like an iPad. Okay. And you know, if you're talking about racing, at the end of the day, it, it's a lot. A lot of it is about marketing, right? It's about selling cars. That's certainly why GM or Ford or uh, any of the other big companies get involved in it. It's a way to promote their vehicles. And uh, there's this old adage. Win on Sunday, sell on Monday. In other words, if you have success on the racetrack, that kind of translates throughout the brand. And uh, we had some fun here on, on this panel looking at uh, three different examples so of that branding from three different eras and representing all of our Detroit three automakers, not coincidentally, but at the top you have the Henry Ford company, which was Henry Ford's second automobile company. And some of you may be familiar with the, his story. He failed twice in the auto industry before he founded Ford Motor Company in 1903. And uh, you see here on the ad for company number two, he's uh, promoting the sweepstakes car, which we saw at the opening of the exhibit. So he's using his racing success to uh, advertise the brand. So we go down there in 1972, we have a super sport Camaro, which uh, yes, it's a little faster, a little more powerful than your standard Camaro, but it's largely made up of uh, what we would call an appearance package. So you get a spoiler, you get uh, other kind of racing inspired body trim that don't necessarily add to the speed or performance of the car, but they certainly look cool. And then at the bottom here, this is an early example of the, uh, the photo here, but that's uh, a Dodge Viper ACR edition, which is a legitimate racetrack ready car that you could go buy at your dealership. And those cars have always fascinated me. You know, I have a secret uh, desire to have a Ford Focus RS, which is an example of one of those cars where you can go and if, if you have the cash, you can uh, go out, take it to the track and race legitimately. So that's fun to talk about uh, here in this section. And got to have a quote in there. In fact, as you walk through the exhibit, you will see we have quotes scattered both within it and outside the exhibit, quotes that kind of get to the heart of racing. And here's one from the executive chief engineer for Corvette. And uh, I think it, it says it all when you're talking about marketing and racing. Uh, it is difficult to imagine what the Corvette brand would be like without Corvette racing. It really improves our products and resonates with our fan base and owners. And, and that's what it's all about. It, and I would argue Corvette is, is one of those rare cars, maybe along with the Mustang, that it's it's not just a, a model or, or a make. It, it's a lifestyle, right, unto itself. People are, are loyalists to the Corvette. You can go to Bowling Green, Kentucky, visit the Corvette Museum and see people who have made pilgrimages from around the world to go there to uh, to the home of the Corvette. So it's a perfect uh, place to, uh, to tell that story in a perfect car with which to introduce people to sports cars and sports car racing. But let's get into the Sports Car Performance Center proper. And, and what I want to do here first, and, um, and when you can add some comments as we go through here too, but we want to look at the evolving design of that space, how it changed over time. Because I think it's fair to say that, that this space maybe changed the most dramatically of any of the spaces we, we worked at, Wayne. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I mean, you know, the whole design process is a series of little changes here and there. But you are correct, the Sports Car Performance Center we did look at several options, which you all will see today. Um, and I think, you know, we landed on a really great solution. And a lot of times just that design process, that's how we get to where we get to. Um, and yeah. And those of you who've been, been members for a while or been following us for a while know that this exhibit has been in development for a very long time. In fact, its origins can be traced back to a, a research paper that, that my predecessor, Bob Casey, wrote back in 2007. So that's when the first serious talk started. And then, of course, we had the the economic problems there in 2008. So this exhibit went to the back burner. Then we updated uh, what was then the Automobile in American Life and is now Driving America in uh, 2011, 2012. So I would say it probably wasn't until about 2015, 2016 when, when racing came back up to the front burner and, and started uh, percolating again in a serious way. So the first image I wanna show you, the first concept art is for the concept of our sports car performance center as it existed then. And it was not called a sports car performance center at this point. I think we simply called it the shop is kind of a, a working title, but uh, our, our initial goal and, and one that I think still holds true to the as built section was to focus more on the science of racing in this section. You know, it's not so much about the personalities or about the, um, the marketing side of it or the business side of it, but about the scientific principles that allow a car to go fast or faster. But our initial uh, idea was to have three different cars in there. And uh, if you're familiar with our collection, you might recognize the 1935 Miller Ford over here, which is famous as a failure 
in racing, right? Henry Ford had these cars built with Harry Miller very quickly. I think they started work at the end of February of 1935 to be ready for the beginning of May to get to the Indianapolis 500 that year. Obviously not enough time to work out all the bugs. And in fact, there was a, a flaw in these cars that caused every one of the 10 that Ford set down there to uh, basically conk out and none of them managed to finish the race, much less win the race. But Failure is an important part of racing. In fact, it's it's a bigger part of racing than victory for a lot of teams. So we wanted to have that car there. We have our March Cosworth uh, from 1984 in the middle here, which is a more modern version of an Indy car with uh, ground effects, right? The sort of uh, tunnels and corridors around the car that allow air to work to support the car, to hold it down to the track and to help it go faster with better grip. And then it's kind of cut off here in, in the rendering, but our last vehicle over here would be our Buck and Thompson Slingshot Dragster from 1960, which uh, that's fun because they were a couple of, of amateurs, really a couple of kids from the Chicago area who raced around tracks there in Illinois and, and in the Indiana. And uh, there we could talk about engineering and uh, basically glorified hot riding. I mean, they were building their, their V8 engine using parts out of the Edelbrock catalog. So, uh, you know, racing engineering isn't always done in these special shops. Sometimes it's done in somebody's own garage. So that was our original vision. And you can see we, uh, we were going to be clever with our, our barriers there, putting in fuel drums and uh, toolboxes and chests rather than just uh, simple railings. But um, that got changed as we started thinking about the story we wanted to tell in there. And we realized and frankly, this is something, a story that didn't exist in 2015, but in 2016, all of a sudden Ford decided they were going to go back to Le Mans, right? For the 50th anniversary of their first win in 1966. And we thought, you know, this could be a terrific opportunity to follow a car from start to finish and really look at these stories uh, through the lens of one major event. And this is Mark II, if you'll pardon the expression, for our uh, Sports Car Performance Center. Now it was called that, but we were going to have our, uh, our winning car, the 2016 Ford GT that won at Le Mans, which Ford has loaned to us for the past few years, on a lift in the center. And again, sticking to, to scientific principles, but, but Wing, as is, is I'm remembering here, I think we had a, a guiding principle there of, of stop, stick, start, right? We were going to look at uh, how yeah, cars, was, yeah, held to the ground, yeah, how it's not going, how they slowed down. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it was stop, stick, go. And oh. we we're really trying to break down, you know, the the concepts of racing and what makes a race car perform well into sort of simplified things. You got to go fast, you got to stop fast, and you got to stick to the ground. Yeah, so we put together these different stations, you, and you can get a sense of what the stations we're going to talk about just looking at here. You know, one obviously was going to be about grip or sticking with tires. Station two was going to be more about aerodynamics. So we had different front ends and uh, from IndyCar and NASCAR here. And then uh, station three, maybe talking more about the power. And we had a couple of engines on stands here. And we, we showed this, this concept art to where else would you go to some actual professional racers. We went to some, some drivers, some team owners, uh, and some, some mechanics, folks on, on the engineering side of racing. And uh, you know, I think they were enthusiastic about the idea, and they, they certainly thought there was merit in the story, building it around the GT. But I, I think there was some concern about just the, the layout we went with in the garage, the sort of aesthetic look of it, if you will. And it's probably that checkerboard uh, flooring that, that bothered them more than anything. But, you know, I heard uh, one or two people wing, I think, said it, it looked a little more like uh, some some somebody's weekend garage, like a private collector or maybe somebody who races for fun more than it did a professional garage. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's OK. That's why we went to those folks. We wanted their, their answers. We wanted their feedback. So taking that to heart, we went back to the proverbial drawing board. And uh, you came up with this new concept and uh, we're still featuring the GT, but now instead of one car on a lift, we were going to have three different cars. So we could follow the development of the car through three different stages. And this top down view doesn't give you the best look at what the, the room looks like though. Don't worry, we will show you that soon. But uh, you see, we wanted to go through, through three different phases here. Design, talking about the original conception of the car, uh, optimization, kind of refining the car, proving it through racing. And then, what we would call implementation or, or following through on the plan. And of course, for Ford and the GT, the ultimate goal was to win the 2016-24 hour of Le Mans, the 50th anniversary of their first win. So a nice story with three parts, cut and dried. Yeah, and that actually really allowed us to take the original concepts, you know, stop, stick, go, 
some of the other individual ideas that we had wanted to talk about, but put them together in a more cohesive story. So we still address all of those, but you're seeing a little bit more how those are working together through this process of design and development. And so, yep. With that said, we'll take you through those doors. And this is what you're going to see when you come into the exhibit on, on Friday or whenever you make it here. You'll see it's called Sports Car Performance Center. And it's really, apart from the theater, it's the only part of the exhibit that is kind of walled off in, in a gallery unto itself, which works well for a couple of reasons. One, it allows us to, to have that kind of shop feel. So you do feel like you're walking into a different space. But it also helps us to say, you know, this is a, a story that is a part of the exhibit, but it also is sort of a separate story. We're going deeper into one particular car here than we do in another area. So it, I think it worked out nicely. And, and I will say at the get-go, we had tremendous support throughout the project from Ford Motor Company, from Multimatic, which some of you may know is a specialty uh, performance manufacturer located actually outside Toronto, and they built the GTs for Ford Motor Company. And also support from Brembo, who built the, the brakes for the, uh, the GT. But this gave us a chance to acknowledge the support from Multimatic and, and do it in a way that felt very natural, too, by putting their, their name on the door. So it's as though you're walking into a Multimatic shop here. And the first thing you're going to see is we have to, of course, give you some context, give you some history. And I, I've already mentioned this, but Ford's whole inspiration for returning to Le Mans in 2016 was because it was going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of their first win against Ferrari in, in 1966. And I would imagine, I would hope, probably a lot of you have seen the Ford versus Ferrari movie that came out a couple of years ago with uh, Christian Bale as Ken Miles and Matt Damon as, as Carol Shelby. Uh, here we're looking at uh, an actual photo of Henry Ford II there in the middle in the uh, suit and tie, and then uh, Bruce McLaren on the left and uh, Chris Amon on the right. Those are the drivers that won in 1966 with their car in the upper uh, upper right corner there. And if you've seen the movie, you know it was not without controversy, right? Ken Miles, uh, by, by all accounts, could have won that race and perhaps should have won that race, but Ford decided they wanted a dramatic one, two, three finish, which... Uh, goes back to the idea of marketing, right? Ford, Ford doesn't particularly care which team of drivers is going to win that race. They just want the victory and they want that dramatic finish of all three cars tying. And not to belabor the point, but if you've seen the movie, you know that you can't tie at Le Mans because it's not so much about uh, the speed at which you race. It's about you know who covers the most distance driving for 24 hours. So if the cars start at staggered positions, which they do, the car that starts farthest back technically covers more ground, even if it's just a few feet. So uh, anyhow, long story short, uh, that's, uh, that's how the race shook out there. And you're going to learn about that race as you walk in, of course, to set up Ford's long heritage at Le Mans. And here's a nice panel, I think, that goes further than just that. We have that photo, of course, of the famous one, two, three finish there in 66. We also have 1967 Ford won again with the Mark IV. And that is a car that is part of our collection. And then uh, Ford dropped out of the race. They weren't sponsoring it as a company anymore after 1967, but a private team came back and won in 1968 and 1969 with the GT40. In fact, one with the very same GT40. And uh, that's a very rare feat. It's not the only time it's been done, but uh, certainly one of the few times that a single car has won Le Mans more than once. So we can look at that. And then of course, have to have a shout out to the Ford versus Ferrari movie. Another thing that did not exist in 2016 when we were talking about this story for the first time. So glad we could work that way in. And this photo is actually the trophy that Ford won in 1966. And uh, we don't have a whole lot of trophies in the exhibit. There are a few that you'll see as, as you walk around, but I, I've kind of developed a theory in working on this and I don't mean to, uh, to denigrate or speak poorly of any races, but it, it's become my uh, uh, conclusion that uh, the, the larger, the more gaudy, frankly, the trophy, the smaller the race, <laughs> that makes sense. It seems the biggest races have pretty small, pretty modest trophies, and, and the smaller ones that are at the local dirt tracks tend to go over the top with giant cups. Uh, now, saying that, the exception that proves the rule is the Borg Warner Trophy at the Indy 500, which is giant by anybody's uh, description. And we, I wanted to explain here to the audience, uh, one thing they will not see in the Sports Car Performance Center is the Mark IV. 
And you might wonder, well, that's a car that won at Le Mans for Ford. Why wouldn't that be in there? Well, a couple of reasons. One, frankly, space. There's only so much room in that sports car performance center. But two, because we do have that separate winner's circle zone where we wanted to talk about the real game-changing cars. And the Mark IV fits there beautifully. And, and as important as that 66 win for Ford was, the 67 win has its own story. That was the, uh, the all-American victory, right? Uh, I mentioned Bruce McLaren and, and Chris Amon winning in, in 66. They were both from New Zealand. In 67, you had Dan Gurney from California, A.J. Foyt from Texas. So you had American drivers, an American team with uh, Shelby, an American, and a truly American-built car. Uh, the GT40s may have been Ford Motor Company cars, but they were built in Great Britain for the most part. Uh, so that changed with the, the Mark IV. So that's what makes that car so special. A couple of other associated pieces you'll see here. We've got a steering wheel. This is really cool with... Uh, the autographs of all the drivers who were with the uh, Ford program in 1967. So you'll have time to study it when you come to visit the exhibit, but you'll see some very familiar names there, including Mr. Gurney and Mr. Foyt and uh, Mario Andretti, another name some of you may have heard uh, over the years. And then the trophy from 1967 here as well, which again kind of goes back to my, it's, a, it's, it's rather fancy, but it's fairly modest in terms of its size. Wrong way, uh, so we'll go one more. And we also have a time to uh, talk about a couple of those folks in the exhibit too. And, and these are our profile panels for Carol Shelby and then Dan Gurney. And uh, yeah, we really don't do the profile panel, panels as I think about it when in the Sports Car Performance Center because it's kind of sets apart from uh, the rest of the exhibit. But throughout the rest of the exhibit, you'll see close to 50 different people and not just drivers, but engineers, team owners, uh, profiled throughout here and talking about their contributions to racing. So I, that's exciting to me. And I think that's true, Wing, from the beginning. We wanted to make sure that this was an exhibit about people, perhaps even more so than cars. Yeah, and in addition to these people panels, you also have the opportunity to hear from people too. As we got quotes and you actually can push a button and hear them speaking, which I think is a really exciting uh, feature. And it's not just drivers or famous people, people from all over the world of professional racing. And uh, we, with these panels, you know, we tried to find a, a great quote from, from everybody. And uh, Carol Shelby's quote is, is one of my absolute favorites. He says, here, you know, he, get asked 20, he gets asked 20 times a week, you know, what's your favorite car? And he always answers the same way, the next one. And I think that's something that we see time and again with, with racers. You know, they, they, they learn from the past, but they're always focused on the future. It's not what they did before. It's what they're going to do next. Back on the, the point of history, we're in the Sports Car Performance Center. Again, you're going to see a, a drafting table. It looks like you, you know, your drafter sitting down there designing a car, but we've laid out a graphic here, which kind of traces the history of the Ford GT. It was important to us to ground the 2016 GT in the past. So uh, there's this great evolution of the GT graphic here, which takes you through the, uh, the original GT40, the Mark II, which won in 66, the Mark III, which is the street version, the one you could buy, from the 60s car and then the Mark IV on up to the 2005-2006 the Ford GT, and then of course to the, the current 2016 GT. And then it even goes back to the Lola um, Mark VI, which was really the inspiration for the GT's 40s original look. So we try and do all that. This is a fun little chart too that came out of a, a magazine. It was uh, Floyd Clymer's Auto Topics, I think, from 1967. But it traces, you'll see the, the Mark IV down here in the corner, but it traces them all the way back to the Mustang I. And of course, that's neat because that's a part of our collection as well, although it's not in the racing exhibit. It's, it's always fun when you can tie a couple of collection vehicles together. Got to talk about Le Mans, of course. So when you walk into the Sports Car Performance Center, we have a panel that explains what it is about the 24-hour Le Mans that makes that race so special. And it is often compared to the Indianapolis 500 and the Grand Prix at Monaco as being one of the three most important races in the world. And um, how else can you say it? I think the real challenge here is that you're racing all out for 24 straight hours. And for many years, uh, it was a problem just to get your car to survive for 24 straight hours, right? You wanted to go as fast as you could, but not so fast you were going to break the car because that would end your race. Uh, in the last 20 years or so, the cars have gotten so good that's not so much an issue anymore. It's more of a driver's race now than a, a technology race, but you've still got to maintain your, your senses, your, your alertness, your, your perception for 24 hours. And you drive, of course, in relay teams. It was two drivers back in the 60s. Now it's three drivers who take turns driving in shifts of two hours, I think, more or less. And the course itself is a combination of the long back, uh, what they call the Mousson Straight, where the cars get well over 200 miles an hour. 
to uh, these sharp corners here and, and chicanes here as you get closer to the finish line. And it's a combination of purpose-built racetrack and other roads, which the rest of the year are actually public roads, public highways. So it's, it's a real, real fantastic race. And of course, half of it uh, taking place in, in summertime like that takes place in the dark or a little less than half, I guess. But to, that's uh, a challenge in and of itself. And inevitably, there's always bad weather. It rains for some period of the race, but quite unlike anything else. Now, I want to talk for a moment about uh, the guiding principles sort of behind our sports car performance center, and that is our model I language, which some of you may be familiar with as members. Our uh, learning engagement uh, team came up with this, and, and Wing, I should say, we had a member of the learning engagement team on our exhibit development team the whole time, Rob O'Leary, right? Yes, we did. And uh, Rob came up with this notion that we should incorporate this model I language in the exhibit. And what this is, is a way to kind of trace the habits and actions of innovators. What is it that makes innovative people distinct and separate? And as you look through these five steps, you see uncover, define, design, optimize, implement. So thinking about a problem, you kind of uncover what it is that, that the world needs. You define what it is that you're going to do. You design whatever it might be, your innovation is going to be. You optimize it, refine it, and then you implement your plan. And we had a chance to look at three of those steps with the GT, the design, the optimize, the implement. So it fit very well with Model I. And there is a panel in the Sports Car Performance Center that sets this up and explains what Model I is all about. Design. I really like that, I really like that setup because yeah. not only does it get to sort of the actions and habits of innovation, which is what we're talking about, it really provided a nice way for us to tell a story at the same time. Yeah, it's a perfect framework to, uh, to establish the story. And so speaking of design, our, our star car here, this is a full-size clay model of the Ford GT, uh, the 2016 one that was used over across the street at Ford's Product Development Center. And uh, I think people will be surprised, one, that they still use clay models. Uh, you would think with all the work that can be done with uh, computer-aided design, uh, there wouldn't be need for clay anymore. But the, the designers will tell you that there's no substitute for something full size that you can see and appreciate in the real world. So you can take this car out outside, see how natural sunlight plays with it. You can put uh, film or skins on it to try different paint colors and paint schemes. And of course, if you don't like a particular contour or curve, it's fairly easy to go in there and reshape that clay. And uh, I can't say enough about uh, Ford Motor Company's help with this uh, when they let us go right over there, basically to the uh, the Performance uh, Development Center and kind of look through their leftover parts from the GT program and, and choose what we wanted it. And this car was among them. Yeah, it was amazing to go over there and just see the history of the design kind of sitting there and, you know, talking with the people who actually worked on the vehicles. Um, the, one of the fellows who carved this, you know, brought the car over and made some minor repairs on it and stuff. And so, you know, it's, it's truly the, the real thing. It's part of the lore of the, uh, the Ford GT program that they did all of this work in a secret room in the basement of the product development center. So you'd think they would be in the most current state of the art lab, but no, because they wanted to keep this under the radar, they, they cleaned out, it wasn't exactly a broom closet, but the equivalent of that, but large enough for cars. And uh, I mean, it, it, is, it was not an impressive space necessarily, but no one, no one ever bothered them down there, so they could operate in, in secrecy. And I think that the real story, as they said, when it came to uh, securing access, you know, people at, at Ford, they, they get in and out using their badges with magnetic stripes or RFID chips that unlock doors. Uh, to secure this room, they actually went back to the old lock and key system, so nobody uses physical keys at Ford anymore. So the old way turned out to be the best. Another shot of the other side of, of that car here. And then this is our, our drawing for what the clay model would look like in that space. And you can compare this with the as-built result here. And uh, got a few things going on here that you can see. And, and the uh, drawing I, that explains the history of, of the GT, kind of the family tree, if you will, is over here on this drafting table, the label for the car over here. But uh, the backdrop here, again, gets to that idea of trying to inject motion and movement into the exhibit. And it's a wonderful collection of materials back there. I provided to us largely by Ford and Multimatic, right, Wing? Yep. Yeah, they, they, they were wonderful partners in this, um, gave us access to a lot of, you know, wonderful source material that we were able to just pull into the exhibit and have available for our members and our guests to sort of take in and experience and enjoy. 
Yes. So as you stand there, you'll watch this montage go by on this large screen, everything from still photos to computer renderings. to I think there's even some, some video clips in there as well. Yeah, and that's presented like a project board. So if you were to possibly, you know, go into the design studio that they had, you know, there was reference materials and these images all pinned up. And so this is you know, evoking that sort of experience. Here's a zoom in on the uh, design panel itself. So we can talk a little bit about the car and uh, how it was, was refined using wind tunnel technology. We even get a chance to talk about Project Silver uh, that people probably don't realize now, but Ford initially, you know, they, they decided to go to Le Mans with about 22 months or so to, to design and build the car, which is, is crazy for one. And, you know, it, it's just, if you're going to do that kind of challenge, you need as much time as you can get. And uh, Ford had a deadline they could not push back, right? They wanted to be ready for that, that 50th anniversary, which was coming in June 2016, whether they were ready or not. So their initial idea was to just adapt the Mustang. But as, as the story goes, as they refined it, shaped it, improved it, it got to the point where it just didn't look like a Mustang anymore by the time they changed the bodywork. So they ended up working from, from scratch, designing a whole new car with the Ford GT. And Wing, we should say there's a, a little cameo here for one of our advisors in the corner. I wonder if you could tell folks the story there. Yeah, you know, when we started working with Ford and Multimatic, they really made available, um, you know, wonderful people like Darren here, who's on the upper left, was part of Ford, and part of the design team. Um, I think, I believe that the image shown below is actually something that he illustrated. Uh, and so, getting to work with the people who actually worked in the program was really great for uh, allowing us to you know get a truly authentic story as well as all the assets that you see on this panel you know are true behind the scene pictures they're not just sort of the marketing stuff that was put out it was actual you know illustrations they did and concept renderings to get approval to actually working in the shop you know some of the the wind tunnel and the aerodynamic um, computer generated imagery that they were actually, you know, reviewing and presenting in their internal meetings and whatnot. It, it was a real gift to be able to do this so, so close to the actual time it happened. I mean, we, we started doing this uh, just a couple of years after that, that victory at Le Mans. So as we said, the people were still there working for Ford or working for Multimatic and the assets were still there. All of these wonderful drawings, the concept art and uh, with a car that's 50 or 60 years old, you just don't don't see that there are too many holes in the, uh, the record, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, we had that quote we showed you from the Corvette uh, chief engineer. We've got a quote in here from uh, Raj Nair, who's the president and chief operating officer at Multimatic. And I think this just kind of speaks well about, uh, about what racing is all about. Why race? Because it's part of our DNA. Competition makes us better. And not just our technology, but also our people and our culture. We race to win. So an, another one of those quotes you'll see as you walk around. We have a, an aerodynamic design interactive near there. And this is a, a computer monitor that you can go in. It's a touch screen. You can touch it, move it around. And I've got just a few screenshots uh, in here to show you. But what it does is really allow you to compare the racing GT with three other vehicles to compare it in terms of its, its aerodynamics and its uh, effects in, in a wind tunnel. And uh, here's sort of the introductory screen. You see all these little, um, I'm going to date myself here, but these little coins, they remind me of the coins in Super Mario Brothers here, but they flip around, you touch them, and then they explain what it is that that feature contributes to the car's aerodynamics. So in this case, it's the, the rear spoiler of the wing, and it says the fixed rear wing produces downforce to increase grip on the track. And you can see the other vehicles you can compare it with. Obviously, this is the racing version, but the production version of the GT, a pickup truck, and then a semi truck. And as you can imagine, all three of, or all four of those vehicles have very different characteristics when put in a wind tunnel. Here's how the air flows around the racing GT. You can see obviously very smooth. Uh, on the front, you have the splitter and the smooth surface to help uh, eliminate as much turbulence in the front as you can. But it's also designed to sort of close up the hole that the car punches in the air as well in the back. So you reduce turbulence on the rear end as well, which can act as a drag to slow down the car. And here's our uh, model of the car, uh, sort of a front view compared to those other vehicles. And uh, it's maybe a little surprising, but the um, the racing version has a larger surface area and actually produces a little more drag than the street version. And uh, obviously, you know, they both are, are far more efficient than the pickup truck or the, the semi truck. But, you know, I think they had to make some trade-offs there, Wing, with the street version, right? 
Yeah, I think one of the one of the aspects of the story that I've just really enjoyed working on this is finding out just how much of a balance it is between you know performance and other things that you might consider a drawback. So in this case, they were actually okay increasing the amount of drag because of the sheer amount of downforce that it actually provided in the end. And all through the story, you know, it's, it's a it's a balance between trade-offs between engine performance and aerodynamics of the vehicle and the weight gains versus you know the heat and stuff uh, and just a few more here's the semi truck not surprisingly does not perform very well in terms of aerodynamics so they they do what they can with rounded corners and the uh, sort of air dam or, or spoiler up over the cab our optimized car is Probably the most, uh, you know, it seems strange to say this, considering we have a race winning car in there, but maybe the most fantastic piece we have, Multimatic built for us a half and half car. So you're, you're not seeing things in this photo. This half of the car is the racing version of the GT. This half is the street version. And I'll flip it around here. You get a better look at that street version. And uh, I think, frankly, Multimatic had enough spare parts around to not build a complete version of each car, but a, a half and half. And I, I can't say enough about the phenomenal job they did with this vehicle. It really is beautiful to see how it comes together. And Wing, I think the story here is not how different those cars look, but how similar the two halves are. Yeah, with the exception of, you know, the, the wing in the back here and a little bit of change in the front, the two cars are almost identical as far as the shape of their bodies go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the other big part of the story is the production vehicle and the race vehicle really were produced sort of hand in hand with one another at the same time. And so they were able to design a vehicle that performed in both those different scenarios really well. Yeah, and that's, that's almost unheard of in the racing world. Typically, when you're going racing, you either devise your racing car from an existing production car or you build the race car and then you create a production version down the road but in this case it was all happening simultaneously here's our, our initial drawing our concept art for what the optimized area would look like and we were thinking initially it was going to be a cutaway car in the more traditional sense with a part of the body removed so you could see the the inner workings but uh when, when multimatic said they could build that half and half car we said by all means let's let's go for it and there's the as built area and you see how it sits there I think it's fair to say one of our, our frustrations, I guess, is that, you know, we couldn't rotate this car more or for that matter, put it on some kind of a spinning platform just because of the space limitations. So, you know, we, we angled it as much as you possibly could so you can see that other side. On the bright side, obviously, we've got the racing car now behind this half and half car. So you can see what the racing half looks like just by looking at the real race car. But uh, you get good views from the front and the, the back of this vehicle for sure. Speaking of the back, here we are. And again, more, more video from Multimatic here on the background as well. Here's the label for the cutaway car where we can talk again about the race car versus the, the road car and explain what makes this significant. We can also talk a little bit about the technology, right? And these uh, Multimatic dynamic suspension spool valve dampers, which could be adjusted uh, at the track to, to make the car handle on different surfaces as need be. So we can talk about that and, and optimization here. The GT was not a success out of the gate. In fact, uh, Ford was uh, embarrassed as maybe too strong a word. We'll say disappointed in their first uh, race with the GT at the uh, 24 hour of Daytona in 2016, where the gearboxes failed on all of the cars at the end. But that's to be expected with any new car. So they used each failure as a chance to learn and improve the car for the final step. Uh, we also had some great support from Brembo here who did the brakes on the GT, but they created some interactives for us as well. And uh, we're just looking at a, one of the labels they have on the panel or on the wall here, rather, explaining what makes racing brakes different from road brakes here. And uh, here's a look at the panel in real life as it appears there. And, and Wing, I think um, my, my favorite section in here right now are these two different uh, disc rotors or, or uh, discs that you can actually touch and, and pick up to feel the, the weight difference, right? Yeah, you can lift both of those rotors up to um, feel the increased weight in one of them over the other. And we sort of talk about why that is and why you may want one heavier, or lighter than the other. Brembo is also providing a uh, digital interactive there. You can see it on the screen on the left um, that'll talk about racing technology and you know the, the, the their effort within the GT racing program. So. It's it, they're really capturing sort of that that stopping aspect of our original concept. You might say Brembo pulled out all the stops for us. But there you go. Yeah, <laughs> I know I'm mixing my metaphors. This is an Oregon reference, but uh, 
we have uh, implement now is our, our last step, of course, where the, the innovators, in this case, the Multimatic 14, puts their plan in action, which means the 24 of Le Mans in 2016. And here's that dramatic photo of them winning their class, actually coming through and achieving their dreams. And not just on the 50th anniversary, but literally to the day of that 50th uh, anniversary. They, they managed 50 years to the day after uh, the McLaren Amon victory in 1966. And here is now in the space that, that winning car. We've had it, as I say, for the last few years out in the car court. Now it's in a setting, I think, worthy of its significance. And uh, notably, Ford did not clean the car. They actually raced it uh, a few more times after Le Mans, but uh, they always replaced the body, used different panels so they could preserve the original Le Mans body panels with the original grime and dirt and uh, and I suppose dead French insects in there somewhere as well. But uh, it, it really is special and it gives the car, I think, some life that uh, other vehicles don't necessarily have. And there's our panel for uh, racing the GT with a couple of photos there taken at the race. And then, of course, that great photo of our, our winners there on the podium, Dirk Mueller, Sebastian Bourdais, and Joey Hand. And that may be the most uh, exciting space in here with a real inside baseball or racing, I guess, in this case, if you will, is what we're calling our, our pit box center. And this is an idea that Multimatic really gave to us. You know, when they, they go to these races, they have engineers monitoring everything on that car from brake temperature to engine temperature to speed to brake pressure and so forth. And they see this in real time as they go through a lap and, and it's beamed to these uh, stations from the car. So we had this idea of setting up screens that could show the telemetry data from an actual race at Le Mans. Here it is as built. And what you're gonna see are two screens. There's a view outside the car here, a view inside the car with Joey Hand at the wheel. And you are going to follow him on one complete lap around that eight and a half mile or so circuit at Le Mans. And you are going to see the data down here synced in real time to the video. So you see the brake applications, you see the, the speed changing as he goes between the straights and the curves. And it is incidentally the lap in which Joey Hand overtakes the Ferrari, which uh, he'd been vying for for the lead in their class. So uh, a phenomenal thing. And I think visitors are going to love this. If you follow racing, you can really dig deep and, and have a lot of fun exploring all of these different graphs. If you, if you don't know a whole lot about racing, I think you're just gonna be amazed at how much the uh, race teams are monitoring in the course of a race. So this is really exciting. And Wing, I can't think of another museum that has anything quite like this. So I, I'm excited. Yeah, it's quite mesmerizing to watch. And we have a graphic off to the side and you'll be able to see actual photos from the pit box and that this setup is exactly the same thing. You even see those benches we put out there, stools so that you could sit and basically relive this one lap as a race engineer. Yeah. Uh, we talk about the pit boxes being the, the race day nerve center. This is an actual photo taken at the, uh, the 24 of Le Mans in 2016, and you see monitors just like what we've got there. Uh, we also talk here, uh, going back to the 60s, talking about anticipating trouble, right? And uh, we like to say it takes a million, you know, a million things have to go right to win a race, but sometimes only one of those things has to go wrong to lose the race. And there's a whole story in 67 how the windshields cracked and Ford had to kind of scramble at the last minute to get replacements made and then shipped overseas from New York State to France. The story goes they actually sent each of the windshields on a first class airplane seat. I, I don't know if that's true. I'd like to think it is though. <laughs> that's a great story. But we'll wrap up here with one last photo of the Sports Car Performance Center and our three cars as they appear. But I know we, we definitely wanted to give you all a chance to ask questions of, of either Wing or, or myself or, or both of us. So with that, I'm going to stop my share and, uh, and Kat, we'll, we'll turn it over to the audience. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much, Wing and Matt, for this outstanding program. There is so much cool history in auto racing and of course, even more to learn inside the exhibit. And that's a good reminder that we'll have our special members only preview of the exhibit this Friday, March 26th. Um, so I hope to see folks there for that first look in person. Um, so let's move into some of those questions. We have a few that have come in during the talk and I think more will probably continue. Um, so let's start with, uh, why isn't the Ford Mark IV in the sports car performance center? I think you kind of started to tell us that, but maybe tell us a little more. Yeah, no, we, we thought about that. Obviously, it's an important part of the story. It's an important car. But from the get go, we wanted to have uh, our winner's circle at the heart of the exhibit where we could feature important cars that could easily fit in any one of the different zones. But these cars sort of redefined 
their various forms of racing. So I, you know, I think we say in the label that these are the cars, they broke records, they broke traditions, right? So that's where you'll find the Mark IV and where you'll find the Lotus IV, the, the one Indy in 65, the first rear engine winner, broke traditions there. We've also got the key coffer Chrysler there. We have AJ Foyt's Miskowski with the Oppenhauser engine. And then on loan from General Motors, we have a beautiful replica of Rick Mears Indy 500 winner from 1988. Yeah, with those winter circle cars, we actually represent a bunch of different race types. So instead of leaving them in their race types, we pulled them out for these special sort of stories and a special presentation. And they, they kind of cover uh, a lot of different varieties of racing. Yeah. Very cool. Next up, um, you'd mentioned that there, you know, there are a lot of stories of people in the exhibit. Um, and so this question asks, who are some of the greatest racing engineers of all time and what sets them apart? That's, that's an excellent question. And, you know, I, we would have to say Carroll Shelby, I think, right? Even though he wasn't an engineer by training, he was a driver who kind of came into engineering from the other side, but got to include him, I think. And he, of course, is one of our profile people. But you'd asked earlier about um, favorite artifacts or favorite things in the exhibit. And one of my favorites is one of the more modest items we have on display. We have a set of drafting tools that were used by Leo Goosen to develop bracing engines. And, and he's maybe not so well known today, but at the time he worked alongside Harry Miller and Fred Offenhauser and the three of them really dominated American racing in the in indie racing in particular for the better part of 50 years. And uh, I love those tools because you don't think about compasses and, and straight edges and so forth as being a part of racing. But, you know, the, the driver and the pit crew, they're just the most visible member of a team that has hundreds of members, you know, all over working deep behind the scenes. So uh, I would definitely count Goosen among the greatest racing engineers. Very cool. Uh, next, we have a question about uh, getting specific about Le Mans. Uh, what's the speed record at Le Mans? <laughs> That's a great question. I, I do not know that off the top of my head. I, I apologize. I know the Mark IV it was going something like 212, 215 miles an hour in 1967 on the Mulsanne Strait. They're maybe a little bit faster now than that today, but you know, there's a practical limit to how fast they can go. In fact, they've slowed down the Mulsanne Strait. It used to be this long stretch of uh, you know no curves where you could really open it up, but now there's a a kink in the track, a curve to kind of slow people down to prevent accidents. And, mm -hmm. and we've got some really fast speeds on some of our cars. Obviously the land speed cars hold the, the we've got the golden rod, which is 409 miles an hour, 400, wow. yeah, 409.277, I think to be exact, fast. Very cool. Um, now we've gotten a couple of different questions and I'm gonna to try to combine them because folks are asking about, you know, do you have this in the exhibit? Do you have that? So um, questions like, is there anything from the aftermarket of racing such as Hearst Performance or Jeg's Summit, people like uh, Don Garlitz or the first lady of motorsport, Linda Vaughn uh, or anything from Cunningham? Excellent questions. and. Uh... Yeah, Wing, I think we've tried to, uh, to do some justice for the aftermarket world. We have a, uh, a secondary entrance in the exhibit we didn't show you. We show you the big one with sweepstakes and so forth. But if you come in down the timeline, we talk about uh, racing culture sort of outside the track. So it's, uh, it's not just hot rodding custom cars. And we do have some parts from, from different manufacturers like that in the display case there. But it's also about like racing movies, for example. So we have brief clips from everything from uh, a silent movie with Barney Oldfield from 1913, I think, right on up through like um, the Cars movie, Pixar, right, in, in 2006. And, uh, and speaking of Don Garlitz, Wing, we did, uh, we did manage to work in some drag racing legends, didn't we? We did, yeah. We have a we have a lot two large screens actually over the drag racing cars, and one of them features Don Garlitz and uh, one of the famous races that he was in. Excellent. Uh, next, we have a question. Getting back to the Ford GT, um, did the Ford GT win other races besides Le Mans? Excellent question, and and yes, the the first victory for the the GT actually came at uh, at Monterey in May of 2016. So it would have been about a month, six weeks or so before they were doing Le Mans. So I'm sure Ford was very happy to finally have a win to their credit. But I think the total record, they, they raced something like 55, 56 different races and won 16 of them. So not bad, not bad for a car that was built so quickly. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think that's the last question we'll have time for today. We're just about at our hour. Um, so thank you again to Matt and to Wing and to everyone joining us today uh, for the special member program. You know, we love to share our passion for history and for the Henry Ford with our members. And we're so glad that you continue to connect with us in virtual programs like this. Uh, if you enjoyed today's program, uh, please do join us again in a few weeks for our next THF conversation for members. Uh, we'll be exploring some favorite stories uh, and some little known facts from Greenfield Village. Uh, so as we wrap up today, thank you again to all of our members for all that you do to support the Henry Ford. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.